we go. Good morning, Benjamin Hadfield. Teach me to dive. I'm a technical dive instructor, master instructor, all that fun jazz. But what we've learned over the years in diving, and I have learned specifically, is there's so much more to just putting a regulator on, putting your BC on, jumping off the boat and seeing cool stuff, right? And so I really wanted to get into it with the amazing Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza. She is absolutely spectacular. So prepare to embark on an extraordinary journey as we sit down with the remarkable Dr. Mickey, a shark biologist whose story transcends fears inspired by Jaws to become a beacon of inspiration in the world of marine, marine ecology. Now join us as we unravel the depths with Dr. Mickey's 20 year career exploring groundbreaking research, hands-on education initiatives and pivotal roles as she is, plays executive director. I guess you don't play executive director, but maybe sometimes it feels that way. She's the director of Ocean First Institute, a nonprofit. And if you get a chance, make sure to watch for the links and donate to them as well. And again, subscribe to our channel, make sure to hit the like button, the notification button, you know the drill, it's not rocket science. Dr. Mickey, thank you so much. Yes, well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, awesome. Well, can you share with us your story of how your childhood fear of sharks sparked Jaws transformation into a lifelong passion of shark research? Yes, so I am probably not alone in this story, but basically um, I grew up in Colorado. So I uh, grew up in the mountains and had a great childhood out in nature. And uh, when I was seven years old, I went and saw the movie Jaws with my older brother. And I walked out of there forever transformed. I was terrified of sharks. And I thought that they were under my bed. I thought they were under the <laughs> table. I tried out for the swim team and I made it because I was swimming from sharks coming out of the drain. Um, I had a huge shark problem. And the only way that I knew to overcome this really huge fear was to read about sharks and luckily my parents had a uh, animal encyclopedia and it had a whole big section on sharks and i read uh, everything i could and i found out that sharks were not monsters but they were amazing creatures with a very long evolutionary history and my fear disappeared into uh, fascination and that fascination hasn't left me. I am absolutely 100% uh, in love with sharks and they uh, are incredible creatures and uh, I have spent my life trying to understand them and protect them. Absolutely. And they thus need to be protected. So give us a few statistics um, that there's a lot of different groups out there that follow this. How many people get bitten every year and how many people die truthfully? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, so may, what you may not know is that there is an international shark attack file uh, and that uh, has been recording shark and human interactions uh, for over 400 years. And so if you go back, you can understand uh, the yearly encounters um, that have been recorded over time. And typically what we see is about three fatal attacks by sharks on people every year. Uh, and there are a number of shark bites, um, incidents where people and sharks um, uh, have an interaction of some kind. And uh, that's, really, that's really where it is. So there's around three. And so if you put that into context with things like falling vending machines or getting bitten by people on the subway in New York City, um, you have better chances of that. Um, hippopotamus, things, horses, dogs uh, are more dangerous uh, than sharks are to people. So. Uh, it's an interesting statistic and it's something to really think about how we inflate um, the real truth uh, and the real um, danger of sharks. Uh, it's something that we as people just love to do. I'm waiting for Vending Machine Week on a Discovery Channel. <laughs> well, you have, statistically, actuarially, you have 40 vending machine deaths a year and three shark deaths a year. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be more fair to shark, uh, or uh, Bite Week in New York City. That would be a good one, too. So. <laughs> Subway. Yeah, no, it's true. And it just, I think it's a primal fear. You know, there's thalassophobia. People are afraid of looking down when they're diving into the deep, into the depths. And, you know, it's a, it's a primal fear, I think. And it strikes a chord. And I think Jaws represented that, that chord of, you know, the unknown 
and the fear and uh, really played on that. And uh, I think that that unfortunately has left uh, generations of people not really truly understanding uh, what sharks are all about and the tremendous diversity that we see and how only um, a handful of sharks can ever harm you. Um, and there are over you know, 500 different species swimming in the ocean today. So, you know, really, if you take a deeper dive into sharks, you'll understand that, you know, they really are not uh, the monsters that, uh, you know, Shark Week or other, uh, you know, other platforms may sometimes uh, portray them as. Absolutely. Well, let's let's move into that. Uh, so one of the things I've noticed as a diver and, and uh, with vacations and whatnot is that there's shark feeding by hand is becoming a very popular thing. What's your stance on feeding sharks by hand or shark dives through baiting so um, uh, methods as well? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, it's been, you know, happening for, you know, decades in different areas all over the world. Um, I myself have participated in these um, you know, shark uh, dive, cage dive, uh, cage diving, where you know you you use bait to attract sharks. Um, it's it's just one of the tricks of the trade. It's very challenging to go into the water and suddenly be surrounded by sharks. And so maybe that's a misnomer in itself. People believe that when they go into the water, suddenly there's hundreds of sharks <laughs> surrounding you, and there just isn't. You're very very lucky. Um, if you're to see a shark in an unbaited situation, to be to be uh, candid and truthful to you. And so um, when you want to see sharks and when you and want to interact with sharks, many times bait is required to bring in sharks so that you can see them and view them, do research on them. Um, it's just the way uh, the way that it works. And so the question is, is it safe um, to have divers and bait in the water? Um, this has been, you know, debated, uh, you know, for a long time. And my stance on it is that it really depends on the operators and it depends on the people that are, are you know, running the show, so to speak. There are people that um, know what they're doing and then there are people that are inexperienced and may not. And I think that's what um, unfortunately happens sometimes is that situations are not safe, people are harmed, and the sharks are vilified as the as the monsters that did this to people. And so for that reason, it's really hard sometimes to support uh, you know, some of these efforts that, you know, are out there to make money and maybe don't truly understand or recognize uh, these animals for what they are. They're wild animals. Um, so I know that's probably not a real clear answer, um, but it, it's a complicated question. And so in, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I've I know and I know all of the divers watching this probably have heard of fatalities from, you know, these events. And so it does happen. It is not unheard of. Uh, for people to be harmed in baited situations. So let's kind of move on to that. So um, you feel like there's a short or long-term effect to the behavior of the animals in, in uh, the hand feeding of, the, of this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it, it's known, uh, you know, if you go down to the Bahamas or areas uh, where they've been uh, feeding sharks for a long time, just the boat motor noise alone brings in the animals. And so they're habituated and they know um, they're not, you know, and another thing that I'll plug for sharks is they're not mindless man-eating machines. Um, they're very intelligent creatures. And just like any other creature, they know how to survive and they know how to find food and mates. And so finding food, if you can find food sources that are easier than others, they'll they'll take that route. And so hearing a boat um, engine and associating that with free, easy meals, um, that's where they're going to go. And if you go down to the Bahamas and you do some of these experiences, you know very well, just showing up on a site, suddenly you're surrounded by sharks. So they definitely are habituated and they know. Right on. Are there any ethical considerations we need to be addressed in doing this and changing that behavior? Well, you know, I think that's a that's a greater shark question, and you know, is really um, bringing uh, people to share space with sharks the biggest issue facing sharks today? And I would argue, no, it isn't. The okay. biggest issue facing sharks today really is their global decline, and the global decline isn't really um, a result of shark diving, and the global decline is driven by overfishing, and so that's really. I think the biggest elephant in the room um, that as someone who studies sharks, that's where my focus is on. And I feel that if people can spend and share space with sharks underwater and walk away um, with a new understanding of the role that these sharks play in the ecosystem, then it's valuable. Um, because if there is one animal um, on planet Earth that needs help, it's predators. 
um, because as humans, we don't like to compete with predators at all, whether it's on land or in the ocean. And so I think predators have a special consideration uh, or they deserve a special consideration because they uh, regulate ecosystem health. And if we take out predators in the end, we're ultimately hurting ourselves. Right on. So there's an issue. I've been reading both sides of the, the argument about the Mexican uh, Mexico's uh, great white debate and the cage dives. And it's really interesting debate. Uh, what are your thoughts on banning cage diving in Mexico and how it might actually affect the shark populations and the conservation? Yeah, it's a it's a really heated question. Um, and I can tell you just from my point of view, I have been to Guadalupe um, and I ha and it was an incredible experience. Uh, to go and see white sharks in large numbers in 100 foot visibility. Uh, this is a rare opportunity. And it, you know, represented, I think, years and years and years of fishermen going out to this area and understanding that great whites were coming to this place um, in, in, you know, regular numbers. And the supplement and the feedings continued to bring in these sharks um, in in you know regular numbers and and it was you know it was incredible and so suddenly then there were a lot of dive operators there and there were accidents and there were sharks that were harmed and there were some shenanigans with filming companies and other operators that maybe weren't um, you know following their regulations and doing what they should do. And the government shut it down. Um, the reasons behind that, you can speculate on what that is. But at this moment, uh, people that wanted to go out there to learn about sharks and to observe them can't go. And I used to run trips there. And so it's very sad to not be able to go there and to not know what's happening to the sharks that were regularly encountered there. I mean, there are literally catalogs of each of the individuals. We could look at the individuals and their markings. We knew individuals. I used to go out and laser measure them um, so that we could look at growth over time, changes in these individual animals. It was a really interesting way to get data. Uh, to learn more about the secret lives of an animal that is a top predator that you think we would know so much about, but we don't. Um, that was one of the takeaway messages with Guadalupe is there's still so much we don't know. And so shutting this down um, is, is, a, is a shame for researchers, for science. It's a loss. Um, it's a loss for those that would go out and play by the rules and do the right things. Um, and uh, so it's a shame. I think it's a shame for, for everyone. And uh, I hope moving forward that there's a way to reopen uh, with the animals' health and well-being um, front and center. Absolutely. There's also now I, I, I'm weighing in on that a little bit. I've, I've also heard the idea that there's a concern of poaching on in that area as well. That um, without them being fed and without this this industry in that, where it's going to cause a great decline in that in that area and uh, allow people to do more shenanigans in there. Do you have you yep. heard that as well? I've heard that and, and it's absolutely possible. And I think that, um, again, uh, when we look at shark populations, the biggest uh, concern is loss of animals. And, you know, when you have an animal like a great white shark, they're a trophy. <laughs> and I mean, that's just the way it is, whether it's their teeth, their skin, whatever it may be, or just the, the ability to take this animal out. Um, it's a lure for some people. And unfortunately, if you don't have enforcement, which is an issue globally uh, with, you know, removing items and animals from the sea, uh, you know, you can't you can't police everything, unfortunately. So that is a concern. Absolutely. It's it's, it's an interesting debate. That is for sure. As you look at how we've impacted in what you appear to be a negative way, but turns out to be an amazingly positive way that now becomes a big negative as well. So it's, it's definitely interesting. With the great whites, what's the greatest mystery that you're still trying to solve with the great white shark? I think, you know, with sharks in general, you know, many of them have similar physiology. And so they have similar, you know, um, responses to, to the environment. And one of the things that I think is, is intriguing is to understand, well, there's there's so many, but I'm going to try to just keep it keep it uh, short. I think there's two. How do they find each other when they're trying to mate? What's going on there? They don't have cell phones. They can't connect to each other. I don't know. So 
Is it, is it chemicals? Is it pheromones? It, what is it that allows them to find each other in these vast open spaces of the ocean to show up in the same places, perhaps seasonally um, to mate? We're just, you know, peeling back the ocean to understand that perhaps great white sharks off the northeast coast of the United States are coming together in the, uh, you know, off of the Carolinas, uh, North and South Carolinas during certain times of year, perhaps to mate. Um, these are questions we don't know the answer to. And the uh, so that to me is fascinating. How do these animals find each other? And the second thing is, how do they find their way? And so one of the things that hopefully we can talk about later is um, sharks sensory systems. One of those sensory systems is the electrosensory system. And it's believed by scientists that sharks use their electrosensory systems to navigate the Earth's magnetic Field. And this is incredible. So this would be um, using, um, you know, going from seamount to seamount, using um, the Earth's lines really to help you navigate through and show up at the same places. Um, you have your own roadmap, if you will, um, in your own um, sensory system. So trying to tease apart what that looks like and how it works is really one of the last great questions in shark science. That's amazing. And you beat me to the next question because that was my exact was what specific aspects of sensory uh, biology do you find the most fascinating? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that, you know, we we as a, as as humans really, I think, underestimate the ability of animals um, oftentimes, whether it's their cognitive abilities or, you know, their sensory systems or anything. And I think sharks are no different. I think sharks are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They're social animals, which pe which blows people's minds that mm -hmm. we have social structures with hammerheads, which are thought to be the smartest of the sharks in the shark world. They're also the most recently evolved sharks um, but I think just, you know, really understanding, um, you know, what uh, the sensory systems are allow these animals to do is it, it just is fascinating. And um, yeah, it, it, there's just every question you answer really allows you to then refine and ask more questions. And that's what great science does. Right on. So hammerheads are the newest. Who's the oldest? Uh, that's a great question. So there are so many more animals uh, that are that have gone extinct than than are alive today. And so that's really uh, something to think about. And sharks are particularly uh, challenging uh, when we look back in the fossil record to really understand the evolution of sharks. And so when we look at the dinosaurs, for example, we have really great um, fossil records, rocks of the right age in the right place to really give us clues. Sharks are a little bit different because their bodies are made of cartilage and so they don't fossilize as well as bone. And so many times when we look at the fossil record of sharks, um, trying to trace back that evolutionary history back to the beginning, um, we're looking at teeth, we're looking at vertebrae, um, and we're trying to reconstruct what these animals look like. If we're lucky, sometimes we'll have intact, um, uh, you know, body parts that allow us to understand sort of the shapes. Weird um, animals like um, Stethiacanthus, um, uh, world tooth sharks that look like they have buzz saws in their jaws. Um, some of the earliest sharks, um, you know, are, are bizarre in, in comparison to some of the ones that we see swimming in the ocean today. But again, life is almost an arms race. So what was required to survive in an ocean 400 million years ago is not perhaps what is required today. And that's why sharks are such a fascinating group to study, because they have that long history with which we can trace some of these amazing adaptations that we see manifesting in, uh, you know, the bodies of animals swimming in the water today. Neat. So there's been some recent discoveries on the Meg. Uh, what did we find out on the Megalodon? So Megalodon's story is, is really interesting. Around 2 million years ago, we think Megalodon went extinct, which really is the blink of an eye, geologically speaking. Um, and, you know, we think that perhaps there were a couple of factors that drove uh, the demise of the Megalodon. And one was their sheer size. So imagine being a 60 foot plus, uh, perhaps large predatory shark, your, your caloric needs were great. They used to eat whales. So imagine uh, the, the uh, amount of effort involved in feeding uh, an animal of that size and magnitude. And so we think that perhaps with the rise of white sharks, um, there was competition 
And perhaps as uh, climate changed during that period, uh, food was not as plentiful for Megalodon and they had faster um, counterparts like uh, the great white that came in and they were more nimble uh, and they didn't have and they didn't require the same caloric needs. And so there, there's a couple of different ideas uh, behind what drove Megalodon out. But those are some, uh, you know, competition and uh, changing climate, um, changing ability for them to persist in, in a world where, you know, things uh, were rapidly changing. Right we're on. facing that today. Absolutely. Right. And of course, you've seen the movie The Meg, a, a totally a, a documentary, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it was good stuff. Yeah, great stuff. Jason Statham made the whole movie, though. There we yes, go. he did. <laughs> he did. He's amazing. Uh, so, uh, Mickey, how has your experience as alumni of Dr. Kajuji, uh, Kajura's lab influenced your approach to researching and understanding sharks? Yes. So Dr. Kajura is uh, a, an incredible mentor, uh, and he uh, really was interested when I first met him uh, in hammerheads and their um, head shape and really why do hammerheads have the weird head shape. And mm -hmm. his uh, research uh, that I did with him really opened up the opportunity to look at visual um, structures. You know, is do hammerheads even see straight ahead as they're swimming through the ocean? Um, do they use their electrosensory system um, in combination with vision? How do they process all of this information? Um, so he and I worked a lot on sensory biology. And I think what we've done uh, now is really try to find ways to use that information in conservation and to make that translation from, you know, academic science to how do we get that to, you know, the, the people that are out there that are trying to understand sharks and trying to conserve them and really, you know, moving into the next important questions. And right now we have uh, a student who is working through the Institute with Steve as a student. So we continue to work together. And, and I think that's the beauty of um, science is that you collaborate and sometimes the collaborations can span um, your entire academic career, which is really exciting. And that's pretty amazing as well to pick a field of study, uh, ask a question and have that chance to work on it and it'd be a career question. Yes, so what, absolutely. What's your big career question? Yeah, so the, the big career question, and this is so exciting for me to share. So the, one of the biggest uh, questions that I had was relative to hammerheads and trying to understand why, what is the functional significance of the hammerhead head? Why did it arise? Why do they have it? And is it good for them or not? And uh, we you know, did a lot of studies on their visual fields and their electrosensory system. And what we found is that we didn't think hammerheads could even see straight ahead. Well, they can. Their eyes are canted slightly forward on those uh, on that big head that looks like a big bow plane. And we found that they have big blind spots just in front of their head. So just like when you put your finger here, you can't really see. Um, mm -hmm. We found that they have these big blind spots. And we believe that the electrosensory system um, works in that void, that visual void. And the electrosensory system is just that on the snout of a shark, they've got these jelly-filled canals called the ampullae of Lorenzini that literally allow the shark to feel weak electric fields generated by living things. And so having the visual void in front of their head um, and, and having that filled in with the sensory system, the electrosensory system, just shows these are perfect predators. Um, these are uh, incredible animals that have adapted to do very well in their environment. And right now at the Frost Science Museum in Miami, they have a whole exhibit of my work where they show the visual fields of hammerheads and you can put your head into a little hammerhead and see what it's like to see as a hammerhead and what their world looks like and how neat to have the research translate into something little kids are running up and down trying to, to get a glimpse of what it's like to be a shark. And I can't think of a, of a neater thing. And we even had the work um, in a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> I thought that was pretty amazing. It is. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. How fascinating and amazing. Um, so uh, changing gears just a little bit, the, you work with Ocean First Institute and you focus on marine uh, research, conservation, education. Can you a little elaborate a little bit on some of the high profile conservation projects that your institute is involved in? 
Yeah. Um, so we do uh, a lot of work uh, with great white sharks. Um, so that's been one of the latest uh, projects that I've been working on. And the question has been um, how best to detect and find white sharks out there in a big, vast ocean. And so I have been deploying what are called BRUVs, which are baited remote underwater video cameras off of vessels in the um, Atlantic Ocean. And these cameras have bait with them. So they attract the sharks. The sharks come in to see the bait and we get them on the camera. And when we get sharks on cameras, we're able to look at their sizes, the sex, the markings, and that helps us really try to understand which animals are where, when, at what time of the season. And, and it lets us understand, you know, what are some of the best methods that we can use to detect these animals? We also, um, as we deploy these cameras, we uh, grab a sample of water, take that back to the lab with us, and we can extract the DNA from the water. And we can then find out by simply taking water samples near our cameras, whether or not we had white sharks in the area. And the way that we do that is to just find white shark DNA in that sample. And so we've been doing DNA um, as well as brubs together in combination with our fishing effort to just see which method is really great in helping us understand these animals. Wow. That is amazing. White sharks are absolutely fascinating. They're there. I think they they've captured the mind and hearts of a lot of people as um, great sharks, uh, um, hammerheads. And of course, threshers are always interesting as well. But they've got a pretty white sharks have a pretty good migratory pattern. How far do they migrate um, in the course of a year? Yeah, that's really a, a fascinating find of this collaboration. So there's many different scientists that have been working on kind of understanding this whole puzzle in the Northeast Atlantic. And so what we found through tracking um, and tagging animals with satellite tags and all kinds of different technologies, we found that animals go all the way from Nova Scotia, Canada, all the way down to Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico and back again um, in one season. So th this is a vast distance uh, for an animal to go. And these animals are doing this regularly. And what we're finding is that this is almost orchestrated with uh, some of these animals that have been tagged. So we've tagged males, females, juveniles, adults, uh, and so we see these patterns of animals moving up and back and also animals moving off into uh, the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> and so trying to understand, well, why is this shark going over here? Uh, we think maybe pregnant females are moving off um, to get kind of out of the mix, uh, sort of like, all right, leave me alone. I'm pregnant. You know, I don't need to uh, have any more um, interactions. So these are things that are basic, fundamental life history questions, and we're just understanding them now. So uh, I'm really proud to be part of this big group that is answering some very basic questions. Uh, they draw blood. They do all kinds of different uh, tests to try to understand the health and the reproductive status of these animals. That is amazing. So one of the things you mentioned earlier, and this is we'll get into a simple question, and then a little bit more complex question. But how do you sex a shark? Oh, easy. So, uh, oh, so right behind me, whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. See this? There yeah. are two uh, finger-like projections off of the underside of this shark. This is a male. Those are called claspers. So mm -hmm. males have external uh, modified pelvic fins called claspers, and they have two. And that shows that you have a male. That's their sex organ. And then females um, have a cloaca, which is a, a urogenital opening uh, where males will insert their claspers. They have internal fertilization. And then white sharks give birth to live young. That's amazing. So uh, uh, we've all seen on uh, Facebook, Instagram, X, whatever, whatever platform you're on, there's the talk of the 400 year old shark. True or false? Yes. Um, so uh, absolutely. And um, what is really interesting about this is that, you know, techniques have improved over time for us to date um, how long animals live. Uh, and so looking at the Greenland shark um, and looking at um, some of these long lived cold water deep species have really given us surprises um, that we never knew before. And so this could be the world's longest lived vertebrate. And it's a shark. 
And uh, so think about, you know, what this animal has lived through the Civil War, um, World War One, World War Two, all of these things, you know, uh, during the lifespan of an animal like this. Uh, you know, it 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 really is um, as biologists, it was a big surprise um, to have these results come back. That is amazing. What is the lifespan of like a uh, white shark? Uh, we think white sharks live around uh, us around 70 to 80 years. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's the story, that's the cool part of it is that you have that variability. You may have small hammerheads that live seven to 10 years. White sharks may live 80. You've got um, other sharks that could live up to 400 years. You have some sharks that give birth to live young and then others that lay eggs, others that retain eggs on the inside. So the story of the shark is a story of tremendous diversity. That is diverse. What what causes some of the differences between either birthing live young eggs uh, or uh, uh, keeping the eggs with them? Yeah, so that really is a strategy. It's a reproductive strategy. So mm -hmm. when you shed eggs, um, you may be able to have several eggs and the maternal investment is quite low other than just having the eggs. Um, some horn sharks will actually tend to their eggs and go back and try to protect them, um, but it's a strategy. But then if you retain your eggs, um, then they're not uh, as vulnerable to predation. And so that's another strategy, but you have more maternal investment. And then if you have uh, females that will have live young, like hammerheads, hammerheads actually have a placenta and an umbilical cord, very similar to the mammalian condition. It's incredible. Um, so, uh, you know, these are all reproductive strategies. Some um, are very intensive um, energetically for the female and others are not. And it's sort of like hedging your bet. And that's really an evolutionary strategy. Neat. Right on. So uh, great whites and um, we've talked a lot about. We've talked about your favorite shark, the hammerhead. What other sharks are super interesting that you're kind of finding interesting new things about? Um, you know, velvet belly lantern sharks are amazing. Um, these are sharks that literally can glow in the dark. They use chemicals inside of their bodies to create light called bioluminescence. Um, you know, opening up the entire deep sea, um, you know, is something that we didn't have the capacity to do, you know, just mere decades ago. And so this whole new world uh, through ROVs and submarines and, you know, deep diving has been opened up to us. And, you know, uh, you don't have to go to outer space to find amazing things. We have them right here under our ocean. Um, and it's not to say that I don't believe that we should be doing space travel and exploring Mars and things. I do. Um, we absolutely should. But we should also um, understand that our own planet um, has so many unlocked mysteries in the deep ocean. And that includes deep sea sharks. And we are discovering new species um, all the time. When I first started studying sharks, they were in the numbers of around 474, and now we're over 500. So we are describing new species in sharks, um, large ones, which is just surprising, <laughs> really surprising. I hadn't heard of the glow in the dark shark. I think I, <laughs> I found a new thing that I want to research. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about the yes. glow in the dark shark. This is cool. <laughs> yes. No, there are. And there's pocket sharks that have pockets. Um, there are, you know, goblin sharks that, I mean, my goodness, they they are such a treat. There's animal, There's sharks that walk on land. We have land sharks. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Where would I find a land shark? Australia. So we have, they're called epaulette sharks. Epaulette sharks um, are able to uh, walk with their pectoral fins um, during times of low tide when the water recedes and the reef is uh, uh, exposed. They will actually uh, do an action called punting, which is walking with their fins on the reef and they'll go to areas where fish are trapped. Uh, and it's like, you know, uh, fishing in a barrel and they're able to feed on those animals easily. Um, and they're able to stay out of water for upwards of almost an hour without any permanent damage. So this is an adaptive strategy uh, wow. to allow this uh, shark to feed successfully. And there have been new uh, walking sharks uh, described by science in just the last few years. So, again, um, just mind blowing discoveries by shark scientists who care deeply, you know, about these animals and trying to uh, preserve them before they're, they're gone. 
just goes to show you uh, fact is stranger than fiction. I mean, if, if we'd yeah. known about glow in the dark walking sharks, Jaws would have never been made. <laughs> just so yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I, I love it. There's so many neat sharks out there and we've just absolutely, I mean, we, we as tourists who go to, you know, the Caribbean, we see the silkies, the reefs, the yellows, um, the, the occasional tiger and bull. We're like, wow, that's so cool. But it's such the tip of the iceberg. It's not it even is. the coolest stuff. That's no. just the stuff we've seen. Yes. And, and I'm going to do a little I'm going to do a little plug here for you. So if you're interested in learning about all the different shark species, I have a free online shark course called The Truth About Sharks. It's on our website. Um, so we can we can give you the link for that. But anybody can take it and you can learn all your heart's desire about sharks and their diversity and their life history and all of that. So I would be happy if some of the divers watching this would learn more uh, with, about sharks. That link is so in the bio. It's already yeah. happening. Um, I'm, I'm already kind of uh, going there now and I'm taking the course at this minute. Yeah, I'm so, <laughs> super excited. I, I, one of the exciting portions for me, uh, this was three or four years ago. I think it was three years ago. Um, SSI is one of the agencies I'm certified with that teach. Um, they released their shark ecology uh, merit badge, if you will, the specialty uh, diver course. As soon as I found out that was available, I immediately went in and took the course. I watched the uh, the course live at, um, through you guys and uh, uh, to get the certification. And I was like, yes, this is so cool. <laughs> that's me. I wrote that. That's I it. Know. I know. I, that's, that's one good. of the reasons I'm super excited. I, I took your course and I was super excited. I got it immediately. I was like, yes. The, the coolest part about the Merit Badge, the, uh, the, the Diver Certification Specialty, is SSI originally uh, mislabeled it. It wasn't Shark Ecology. It was Shark Diver Specialty. And I was like, and so my original card came out as Shark Diver. And I was like, yes, I'm a Shark Diver because I took a course online. But it was <laughs> it was a lot of fun. That You did an amazing job on that. And I absolutely love that specialty as well. And, and uh I haven't had uh, anybody, I, I don't teach it as a paid course. I teach it as a, an addition to my other courses and I use all the material for that. So you did an amazing job on that. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. That makes me so happy. Absolutely. It was a great, it was so eye opening. There was so much great information, just such, a, such an easy to access uh, piece of material. So thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. I was absolutely in your class. I was in one of the very first classes. <laughs> I actually ended up taking it twice because I, I just, it was in the one hour, I was not able to get everything out of it and take notes fast enough. So I had, I was like, I need to take that one again. <laughs> <laughs> you well, guys did a great you job. love them, you love them, right? That's the thing. Absolutely. So Mickey, how does the ocean first connect with people to connect people to nature and what impact and awareness have you seen in this conservation? Yeah. You know, that really that's been um, my calling is that, you know, I, I see sharks in a certain way and I and and I just want other people to see them that way too. You know, I see them as the incredible organisms with that long history on our planet and when you dive with sharks and you look them in the eye, you know, you're looking back in time as to all of the things that have happened to these animals to bring them to where they are today. And, you know, I, I truly believe we are in a precarious state right now in our ocean and in our value of the natural world and really understanding that these animals not only have the right to survive, but they have the right to thrive just like we do. And I think, you know, the thing that we do at the Institute is talk to people about rethinking our relationship with the world and understanding that, you know, we can all have the food that we need, the creature comforts that we need. The world is an abundant place, but we can extract and take things to make these things in a smarter and better way. And if we do that, then, you know, we, we can solve a lot of the problems that we see today, which is, you know, taking too many animals out of the ocean at a rate that is just not sustainable and doing things like bycatch, doing things the wrong way, doing dredging, you know, the things that are just so destructive and so single sighted, you know, so nearsighted, not looking towards the future. So um, connecting people to those ideas and, and then also sharing that every single one of us has the ability to make a difference. And there are people out there who will say, no, no, it has to come from governments and all of that. And, and I don't agree with that. I think governments play a big role, but I also know that every single person plays a role too. And that is my mantra. Um, if all of us do our best, 
it will be a better place. It will be a better world. And I work with young people a lot because young people still have their whole lives ahead of them and they're, they're optimistic and they're open to change and they're open to ideas. And for me, that's beautiful. And that's what the world needs. Right on. So Mickey, what inspired the emphasis on women and science in your programming? And how do you envision this contributing uh, to a more inclusive and diverse future in marine science? Well, I'm excited to say that I am this just became the past president of the American Elasma Frank Society, um, which is the world's premier shark scientist academic um, society. And I'm an explorer in the Explorers Club. I'm all of these things that I never thought I would be um, because uh, of the work that I do and the passion that I bring. And I know that it doesn't matter um, what gender I am or anything. It's it's what I do and the passion I bring. And everyone can do that. And the focus that we have on, on women is to empower that there are no barriers. There's no boundaries. There's no ceilings. Um, there's nothing to stop us from being who we want to be. And if we help each other find those opportunities, that's the key to all of it. It's not about pushing anybody down or trying to do any of those things. It's about, you know, really bringing each other up. Everyone, you know, in my mind, everyone is equal. Everyone has the opportunity and everyone should have those opportunities and really helping women find opportunities um, and, and know that there are no limits. Um, we don't have to be afraid of math or science or any of those things. Um, you know, there are, and we don't have to be afraid of going on vessels um, and studying sharks. You can do it. Absolutely. I'm a testament to it. Me and a band of other women do it, and it's all possible. Nice. Now, in the idea of moving away from the traditional man versus beast narrative, uh, what role do you feel women are playing in redefining that human relationship with sharks? Yeah, I tell you, uh, there are so many incredible women shark scientists out there, and I am so proud of the progress that women have made to put themselves out there, go out on vessels, ask questions, um, do hard science, do heavy lifting, uh, draw blood, do you know really novel science, um, pushing the envelope in technology. Um, having to do coding and math and, you know, all the things that chemistry, things that we never really thought would be incredibly valuable. But when you study animals, you have to have a huge toolbox. And I think women um, really work well with other women and bring this um, new, you know, vision to shark science that it's inclusive, everyone can do it, and we can all help each other. It doesn't have to be a competitive space. Um, there's enough room at all of the tables for us to work on these animals because there is a problem. And I think as women and as scientists, including all men, we are trying to fight to solve problems to help save these animals and working together. You know, we're always stronger when we work together. And I think that's one of the things that women bring to the table is collaborative opportunities. That's awesome. Uh, by the way, congratulations, Women Divers Hall of Fame. No small accomplishment by any manner means. Thank um, you. One of the newest inductees. Can you discuss the significance of being inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame and how that's contributed to your success in the field of uh, conservation? I can tell you with, n with no hesitation that diving is my life. I can tell you that um, as a young person, it was all I ever wanted to do and be. And diving is central to who I am and to what I do. And to be inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame was an unbelievable honor for me. I never dreamed something like that would happen um, to me. Uh, but I think it just illustrates how critical and incredible diving is uh, for women and for uh what we do. To, as I mentioned before, diving is going into the world's last wilderness and you never know what you're going to see. And it is the ability to dive that allows me to do the work that I do. And it's absolutely <clears throat> essential. And I am just proud um, to be inducted with such incredible women. And I hope that it inspires other women to become divers because once you dive, you don't go back. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing experience that will change your life. 
That's amazing. Such a great organization. The Explorers Club, uh, Women Divers Hall of Fame, great, great organization. Just super excited to uh, have them out there and doing what they do and having people like you as part of it to lead the charge. Um, so you do a lot with citizen science initiatives um, in your research. So how do you incorporate these citizen science initiatives into your research? Yeah, um, it's really important to me as a scientist to try to open the door and bring as many people into the tent as possible. Um, I think science um, is not as challenging sometimes as it's made out to be. And I think that everyone, even children, have um, an innate curiosity. And that's what a scientist is, is someone who's curious, who's trying to answer questions and trying to understand the natural world. And that's all it is. And so I think by incorporating citizen science and bringing people who have curiosity to the table to allow them to have opportunities for meaningful science and projects. I can't think of anything more important. And so um, here in Colorado, where I'm based, um, I run a lot of programs with microplastics, looking at microplastics in the environment. I do it in, in high schools. I have in, in middle schools and even in elementary schools. And I have students looking under the microscope, trying to understand why are these things here in our water system, microfibers and microplastics, but most importantly, how can they make a difference? What can they do to change what we're seeing? And that's powerful. And having them record data under a microscope, add that to a, a database, it's incredible. Um, we do that with sharks. We have students laser measure sharks underwater, record the data in, a, in an online database, and it gets them invested <clears throat> and understanding the value of research because research is what can move conservation forward, but it's also people who care enough to show up and to be part of these uh, projects that really can move these conservation projects forward with politicians and those that have the ability to really make the, the changes in the laws in what we need. Right on. So Mickey, in your opinion, what are some of the simple actions individuals like myself or others can take to contribute to ocean conservation, even though they live far away from the coast? Yeah, I get that all the time. And really, I think it starts with what you buy. Um, that's a really easy way. So thinking about single use plastics, um, you know, we can do better. Um, thinking about using your water bottle. It sounds so trivial and silly, but, you know, one of the biggest issues is, you know, single use plastic. And that is showing up in our ocean, in our rivers, our streams, in the air. Uh, microfibers, thinking about what clothing you, you wear uh, and how you wash your clothing. That's another really big one. Um, and then thinking about what you eat. You know, do we, you know, that's another, and it's a very sensitive topic, but do we need to eat, um, you know, meat um, seven days a week, uh, three times a day? Um, there are ecologically more friendly ways um, to incorporate things in our diets. Um, so what we eat, what we buy, and then what we say, how we model um, the importance of the natural world to other people in our family and friends, um, our, our groups. It's, it's critical to share that the natural world is worth fighting for and it's worth having a career in. And this is not a discounted, silly thing. It's really um, fighting for our own survival to have a healthy, functioning, worldwide ecosystem. We have to have that in order to have healthy future generations that have abundance and have these amazing animals in it. Absolutely. Mickey, one last question. Looking ahead, what are some of the key challenges or better yet opportunities that you see in marine conservation? Yeah, I think really um, finding ways to feed our planet um, sustainably is one of the biggest things. And I think really fighting battles on things like deep sea mining, trying to make sure that we take care of the bottom of the ocean, even though we don't see it every day, making sure that we allow for larval fish to have a chance to repopulate, you know, entire ecosystems. We can't wipe out um, the nursery grounds of fish by doing extractive uh, things like that. So I think really focusing on how we as human beings interact with the ocean, which is you know, the blue lungs of our planet. These are critical things um, as I look to the future. And I think really identifying our connection to the natural world is really the most important thing I, I think I could leave you with is that all of us are connected um, and really valuing and, and taking a moment to lean into that wonder of the world 
is critical. We don't want to lose that connection. And I fear that we're so busy sometimes that we forget how incredible it is to look up at the stars and the moon and to go diving and to have the experience of looking a shark in the eye. These are incredible things. And I think do more of that. Absolutely. Uh, well, like our friend Dr. Sivra Earl says, no blue, no green. It's she got simple. it right. <laughs> Got to quote Dr. Sylvia. She's yeah. amazing. I, I, to be her would be amazing. That's for sure. Dr. Mickey McComb, thank you so much. This has been an amazing interview. What else would you like to share with us today? Oh, I just want to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here and to share um, my passion for sharks. And, you know, uh, I think all of us, as I said, really have that beautiful connection to nature. And I just say lean into it. And uh, yeah, and, and I hope you can take the shark course, learn more about sharks. Do it. Absolutely. The, the, the shark ecology specialty through SSI is a great course. It was extremely well written. Um, the, uh, the writer of it was amazing and uh, was uh, gracious and generous with her information as well. So awesome. <laughs> of course, <laughs> being you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Benjamin Hadfield, Teach Me to Dive. I'm a technical dive instructor bringing on great issues like Dr. Mickey McComb, uh, Kobza is, she's amazing. She's wrote in courses for agencies. She's doing research and she's studying all the cool stuff that we want to know as well. Thank you, Mickey. I appreciate you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all. Bye. Perfect.